Dear congregation, let us turn in God's holy word to Matthew chapter 10. We'll begin reading at verse 27. This is right after Christ has sent out um, his 12 disciples and um, showing that he will provide for them in sometimes even miraculous ways as they minister uh, to to the people and, and uh, rec recognizing that God is uh, giving authority to to his servants and and there will be challenges that they will meet along the way and they're reminded that God will provide for them in every circumstance because everything is known uh, by the Lord and, and so we pick up in verse 27 Matthew 10 let us hear the word of the Lord Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more val of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And he who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple... Assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and infallible word. I'd like to also hear what we confess with Lord's Day 10 regarding the providence of God our Father. Lord's Day 10, you can find it on page 38 in the back of your Psalter if you're wanting to follow along. Question 27. What do you mean by the providence of God? Answer. The almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand, he upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures, so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, and all things come, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Question 28. What advantage is it to us to know that God has created and by his providence still upholds all things? Answer. That we may be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and that in all things which may hereafter befall us, we place our firm trust in our faithful God and Father, that nothing shall separate us from his love, since all creatures are so in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move. As far as confession regarding God's providence. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, I was going to say, can you imagine if some of these headlines were true? But we've heard many of these headlines. 
recently even in some of them have even imp imp impacted us and our families. Sometimes we hear headlines like a mother of five children is diagnosed with breast cancer, only has a few months to live. Or a father is diagnosed with cancer and only has a few months to live. Or children killed in car accidents on their way home from youth groups. The economy is slowing. Interest rates are high. Inflation is high. Many people and businesses are on the verge of bankruptcy. A new law is being passed forcing schools to teach things like critical race theory and having all kinds of LGTBQ clubs and the list goes on. We are on the brink of World War III. How, how do you respond to these headlines? You see, what determines our response to headlines such as these is largely based on how we view the world around us and how we view God and who we are. Do we view the world as a place that's governed and controlled by Almighty God? Or do we view a world governed and controlled by mere man? It will de depend on how you answer these questions. Even though many times they're very challenging questions in the times of tragedy, in the time of evil, and yet we know that God has his perfect purpose and plan in all of these events. Especially as we consider the suffering and death of the Lord Jesus Christ and we enter into a time of reflecting on that also in way of a Passion Weeks before we commemorate this on Good Friday. Just think of Jesus going to the cross and how God ordered all things. We could, we could think about how man might have been involved, but, but there's so many things that had to come together. So many different players, as it were. Think about Judas betrayed Jesus because he's motivated by a love of money. And how the Jewish leaders felt inferior to Jesus and his teaching. And, and they, they were threatened by him and wanted to do away with him. And how the Roman authorities were all involved and, and they just wanted to try to keep peace and, and, and prevent a revolt in Jerusalem. And how Satan is behind this all, seeking to devour the man-child. The ministry of Christ, as he seeks to attack the kingdom of God. And yet, God has so cared for every detail in this plan, that... Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This was the lamb that was prepared. This is a lamb that was provided. And it's all according to God's foreknowledge and plan that he gives his son. Yes, humans are involved and humans are responsible. He doesn't take away any of that responsibility. And yet, he, because he says, you crucified and killed him by lawless hand, by the hands of lawless men. This is, this is God's providence in cooperation with all of these players and events. As God sends his son to the cross to suffer for his people. And as Christ willingly goes 
in obedience to His Father to atone for for the death that we deserve. The Holy Spirit is supporting Him even through it. This is God's plan. This is God's provision. His providence. Well, let's look more about what we confess when we confess God's providence. And we're going to see this with the theme confessing God's providence. First of all, that it, it praises God's attributes. In the bulletin, I put God's power, but as I, as I studied it further and meditated on it further, it really praises all of God's attributes. Not just His power, but all of His attributes. And secondly, it experiences God's comfort. Confessing God's providence, first of all, praises God's attributes. Well, what does providence actually mean? It's the very name we've given to our congregation. And so we ought to know what providence means. It's made up of two words, pro and and kind of like evidence. And so we find pro means to go beforehand. And Evidence comes from the Greek word there, to see. Or sorry, the Latin word, to see. And so what we recognize is is evidence is something that you want to see the facts. You want to see see what it really is. You You want to have the evidence presented to you so you can see it for yourself. That's where we get these words from. But for God to have providence, he's seeing the evidence and he's seeing all things working together before they even happen. And he ordains it before it's, it's even done. I think of how my grandfather would say to us on the farm, you have, if you're not see, seeing what you need to do, and it, you're, you're not seeing it and, and you won't get it done and you won't care for things that, beforehand. And you won't prevent things from happening that are going to take you hours and hours to fix later. And so, so also it is, even though we are finite, we, we have the same intentionality of trying to see things into the future. Things that, that could go wrong so that we can prevent it from going wrong. And so we can order our days and our weeks and our months and our years and so on so things go fairly smoothly in our lives. And we recognize that that is finite. But with God, it is infinite. It is absolutely perfect. He has ordained everything, and he sees beforehand everything that needs to be done. And all things that need to work together in order to accomplish his purpose. Sometimes we say, when you see it beforehand, you can go forward and get her done. There's absolutely this truth about God. So evident in Abraham and Isaac in Genesis uh, 22 when Abraham goes up to Mount Moriah there and he's taking Isaac, his son, and they're going to sacrifice and, and he's carrying the wood and they have the fire and they're, they're ready to sacrifice. And, and Isaac says to his father, what, what, but where's the lamb? And Abraham tells him, God will provide. God will see to it. God will see to it. And there they get to the top. And the altar is prepared. Isaac is the provision. No. Abraham, look, there's a ram caught in the thicket, says the angel. And, and he takes the ram instead of Isaac. God saw to it. And God sees to everything, every single detail, so that Abraham would confess on Mount Moriah, Jehovah Jireh, God provides. He sees to it. And he will see to a lamb that would be given for the sins of his people. And if God sees to these big things, we find evidence. 
He even condescends to show us that he sees to the very smallest insignificant things in this universe. I think of Matthew 10. Even the hairs of our head and the sparrows. God is upholding, governing, protecting. Yes, through his creation, through his providence. Sometimes in supernatural ways of speaking creation into existence or, or through miracles that are done to, to give authenticity to the very work of the apostles or to the deity of Christ himself. But many times through all sorts of natural so-called events, they all in the natural and spiritual realm work together and cooperate to accomplish God's perfect plan. There's no such thing as, as coincidence or luck or fate. God is not some kind of creator who is a deist, as many would call him, that wound up the creation now is just playing out according to chance. No, not at all. God is so involved in it that he cares even for the hairs of our head and the sparrows of this earth. So the first divine attribute that it highlights is God's eternal sovereign power. His eternal sovereign power. Yes, his power in creation, but also, also his upholding creation from moment to moment. God's providence is actively working out his plan and his sovereignty in absolutely everything. There's, there's no big providences and small providences. There's no bad providences and good providences. It's simply all providence. God is upholding all things. Governing all things. By his sovereign power. You see, we might do so and we may have plans and goals set for the day, for the week, for the month, for the year. And so often we look back at our plans and our plan, daily planners and we think, wow, we just, we just failed miserably. This, this happened and, and we had to change our plans. And, and because of the weakness of our flesh, sometimes we can't fulfill our plans. And indeed, our hands are weak and frail and imperfect. But God's word calls us to look to God's fatherly power. His fatherly power. Notice Colossians 1 talks about him being Christ there. All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones and dominions, principalities and powers. Everything was created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist or are provided for and cared for. Acts 17 highlights the very fact that there on Paul on Mars Hill is telling the people, in him we live and have our being and, 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 and he cares for us from through all events of life. Gives life to all things. It's all through his sovereign power. But it also testifies that God is an all-knowing God or an omniscient God. Think about the number of our hairs on our head. About 100,000 hair follicles on your head. For some of us, anyway. Maybe some have more. Some have less. But each person loses approximately 100 hairs a day. And not one of those hairs are falling to the ground without it being the will and directed by our Father in heaven. And you take that times 8 billion people, that's 800 billion hairs that God knows are hitting the ground. Or, or the sparrows, such insignificant birds of the air. Some estimates speak of 200 to 400 billion individual birds of many, like, 13,000 bird species. Uh, there's at least, by other estimates, 
50, 50 billion wild birds and, and, and sparrows seem to be the most insignificant and, and yet God cares for them. They're only, they're only worth a little bit. Even those house sparrows of which there's 1.6 billion in this world. Those insignificant, valueless, as it were. They could be sold for a penny, as it were. Sparrows. And yet, not one of them falls to the ground without it being the will of our Father. He, he so cares for all of His creation. Nothing is insignificant. And He's all-knowing from the greatest event to the smallest detail. God is all-knowing and in control. Not only is He all-knowing, He's, he's all-seeing. He sees every one of those sparrows and knows them. And the very hairs of our head, he knows them all. As a matter of fact, the psalmist praises the all-seeing eye of God so many times. I think it's Psalm 139, Psalm 33, Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, especially for His people. He so cares for His people. His eye is upon us for our good. And his eyes are upon all things in order to care for our good. We live in the face of God in Coram Deo. And all things are before him. You think of how loving and merciful and gracious our God is as he cares for us. And yet, how perfectly just He is in protecting us also from evil and dealing with evil. We serve an all-wise God. God gives us all that we need. Not necessarily all that we want, but all that we need. And he sees it, as it were, all beforehand. And he knows our needs all beforehand. And he's ordained everything so that it would serve our needs beforehand. Someone wrote to me this week and said it's like, like a mother preparing food for her children. Knowing their needs. And preparing it day after day after day. This is in a similar way, but even a far greater way. Our Heavenly Father's power and provision. Ought it not to just lead us to praise God? How great Thou art! But it also, as we see in our second point, confesses, confessing God's providence leads us to experience God's comfort. Notice our catechism says, what advantage is it that we understand this about providence? And he says the first thing is that we have comfort through patience in adversity. We have comfort through patience in adversity. When we understand how great our God is and how he provides for us, even in the midst of adversity, we can have true patience. And true comfort. I, I just can't comprehend the difference here between a Christian and someone who's not a Christian. Someone whose worldview understands that God is in absolute control and working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose and that they can trust in him versus someone who thinks that things just happen by fate or chance. You see, the difference is this. Someone who looks at everything just happening by fate or chance or, or some kind of evils against me and, and they're just going to soak off in some kind of self-centered bitterness and despondency. Oh, poor me! I'm going through this challenge. Oh, poor me! They wring their hands, not knowing where to turn. But someone who knows God and, 
and the power that he has and the all-knowing character of God and the all-seeing character of God. They, they look at the same situation and say, oh Lord, just give me strength to get through this and to glorify your name. I, 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 I recognize that this is challenging, but Lord, how great you are in the midst of this challenge. And indeed, the challenges are real. We live in a world that's broken. Broken with disease. Broken with disasters. Broken through wars. Broken through all kinds of relational problems and difficulties. And yet God is in control. And for a Christian, then, we're reminded, do not fear. Your life is more valuable than a sparrow. Do not be overly anxious because God values you so greatly. And he's caring for you. That you can know that this is all working together for your good. And as we trust in him, then we come to this point where we recognize that I may sometimes lack something which could be good. But I never lack. I never lack what is good for me. I might lack something good, but I will never lack something that's good for me. And sometimes my afflictions are good for me. Especially when they're exercised by faith and they produce in us righteousness, as we find in Hebrews 12. Or in James 2, that the testing of our patience leads us closer to God and in, 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 in a better relationship with Him. And so I can understand something, not perfectly, but I can understand something of this patience that's given in adversity, even at fruit of the Spirit, as we, we could hear last week. Or a few weeks ago, the joy of the Lord, even in the midst of affliction. Because I understand and experience who God is biblically. And as I trust in Him, I'm glorifying in Him. And I'm rejoicing even in the midst of this affliction. Because God is being glorified. And I can know that God sees it. And God sees to it. And God is governing and protecting me through it. He's upholding me by His very power. And He's working it together for good. And I can confess that I know that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus my Lord. And then I can be safe in His hands throughout the challenges, throughout the pain, throughout the tears, through the valley of the shadow of death. I can know that God is with me. He is my refuge. He's my delight in the midst of affliction. Yes, patience is needed to endure the night. But joy comes in the morning. And God gives them both. And I confess that as I experience this truth, I can praise God in it. Trust Him in it. Surrender to Him in it. There once was a young girl. She was sailing with her parents in a large ship. Her father was the captain of that ship. And during the night, there was a severe storm. Everyone woke up in shock as the boat's going up and it's going down and being thrown even side to side. And they'd there's fear written over every face of every person on this boat. Except for this little girl. She too wakes up. And she sees the fear on their faces. And she asks her mom. Says, Mom, is dad still on the deck? Oh, yes, dear, she said. And the child says, well, I'm going back to bed. My dad's in control. 
everything will be fine. That's childlike trust. And in the midst of the storms of our life, in the midst of all the challenges of our life, when we as Christians know our fatherly care for us, then we too can say everything will be fine. Because he gives us patience in affliction. But he also, secondly, produces thankfulness in prosperity through this doctrine of providence. Thankfulness in prosperity. When we understand the kindness of God, which we hope to look at this afternoon, the kindness and the goodness of God in his providing hand, to us, that we are so humbled to give him thanks in prosperity. Because his kindness is shown to us sinners, those who deserve absolutely nothing, who deserve nothing other than hell itself. God comes and he gives us what we do not deserve. Blessing after blessing after blessing. Gives us blessings as we remember in families on family day. He gives us so many blessings in our, in our covenant homes and our families where we can raise our children in the fear of the Lord, taking them to Scripture. As we can come alongside and provide for all of our children's needs. It all comes from God's fatherly hand. As we can gather in church today, twice, provision of two services to be able to worship God and, and to delight in Him along with His people to have a potluck together this evening. His provision. The provision of schools and education for our children. He provides for it all and orders all things that is provided for it all. Would we not then count our blessings, name them one by one? Because despite what we could ever do and, and despite our weakness and even what we deserve, we recognize we're completely dependent on God and his fatherly care for us. And so we count our blessings, give thanks for each one of them. Thirdly, we find that we are reminded that we can have confidence in our faithful God and Father. We can place our trust and our hope in Him. We don't have to rely simply on the means that God gives and through people and so on. Those also are provisions from Him. Our ultimate trust, our ultimate faith is in God and His fatherly care for us. Who are we running to in the midst of trials, in the midst of affliction? Who becomes our refuge? And even when we have blessings, who do we praise and give thanks for them? Is it not God who's the subject of these all? Isn't it the Lord who teaches that he fulfills all of our needs as our provider? And we can trust in him for food and drink, health and clothing, relationships and calling to strengthen our callings. His spirits work in our church and, and, and guidance for our nation. Isn't it him? Isn't it him who we can take all of our cares and concerns to and cast them upon him, knowing that he will exalt us in due time? Isn't it our Father in heaven? You see, really, what ball boils down to is, is this, isn't it? 
Faith is at the heart of it all. As we turn to God and trust in Him, meditate upon His glorious attributes of who He is and how He's providing for us, it causes us to run to the right place at the right time. And I can surrender to him because I know that I'm not alone and that, that he, is, he is making me into what I am through all of the situations in life as his disciple. And I go to him for refuge and hope in the midst of prosperity, afflictions, temptations, and with all my callings. That's what it gives us. Confidence in God. It doesn't mean we sit back in our easy chair and say, well, God's upholding and providing for everything. No, God calls us to, but he also provides for us in it all. And it all promotes in us a dependence on him, knowing that except the Lord build the house, we labor in vain who build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wakes, but in vain. You see, it's God who gives us everything, every breath. We couldn't even move our hand, let alone our finger, or even blink our eye without God. But most importantly, not a one of us could ever be saved without his provision. And maybe we can step back a second and see how God upholds all things and how I can trust him for my daily needs, natural needs. But what about my spiritual needs? If God so cares for the hairs on your head, and God so cares for the valueless sparrows of the air, How much more then do you think he cares for you, his children? He came to give his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to dwell among us, to suffer and to die for us. And he provides it all. He provides everything for salvation. The payment for our sin. The righteousness that we must have in order to have eternal life. The restoration needed for brokenness in us and in creation. He provides it all. I trust if you're sitting in church today that you believe he provides in natural ways. How could you then be so bold as to think that God doesn't provide for you spiritually and that his spiritual provision may not be enough for you? Ought this doctrine not cause us to flee to the blood of Christ? to trust in it, to embrace it, to submit to it, and to praise God for his salvation, his providence. Would we walk with Abraham up Mount Moriah and say, the Lord will see to it. Is that how we raise our children? The Lord will see to it. He will take all of these blessings that we have in our hands. And he will see to it. Do we trust him? Do we plead with him? For his salvation. It's full. And it's free. Because he's provided it all. Amen. Let's pray.
Lord, we give thanks for the truths of your word in the way of providence. We give thanks, O Lord, that because of this truth, we can be absolutely assured that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, when we trust in you. You care for the things that may seem so insignificant in this world with such detail and care and power. Oh, Lord, promote in us that childlike confidence to trust in you also for salvation. And go with us, Lord, upholding us, g governing all things in our lives for our good. Even when we receive things that may not seem good, Lord, help us to understand and know that it is good for us. And exercise it in us, Lord, that we would have patience and joy. And that we would be exercised to greater confidence in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.